Um, it is with great pleasure that I announce uh, today a special guest. Uh, You're being a comedian, aren't you? Uh, no, I'm actually tr trying to be a comedian. I like oh, that. yeah, that's, you know, it's a really sad attempt, but it's always an easy one to set you up because that way you can shine really easy, you know. Mm. Well, um, yes, we have been trying for a very long time. Um, almost every year, I guess, with this whole Academy thing, but now finally, to my left hand, please make him feel welcome, Mr. Derek May. Thank you. How's everybody? Lunch was pretty good from what I could see. You know, what? there's something called itis. You know what itis is? Yeah. Oh, okay, there we go. You feeling itis right now? Itis is when you eat too much and you want to go to sleep. <laughs> so don't go to sleep on me. All right, so here we are. Here we are. So um, let's just pretend we had the opportunity like 10 years ago and we would have done the interview back then. What would have been different? Mm. Probably what would have really been different is I think we would have been younger. And so our backs wouldn't be hurting that much. And, mm -hmm. My um, hairline would be something like that instead of like, you yeah, know. Yeah, you, you grew your hair a little bit more. No, no, I'm, not, I'm just trying to make it look like I'm growing my hair. Huh. What's this tendency of men growing their hair once they lose it? <coughs> it's just, a, hey man, I'm trying to hold on to a little bit of what was. Huh. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> You know, you know the Zinedine Zinan bit back here? You're doing all right. Yeah. You, you look well, good up there. You look good up there. So, no, but we, ten, 10 years ago, I think we would have been talking about rave music and, and trying to preserve techno and trying to keep what was, De what is, what was Detroit's intention and what, who is this, this guy named Paul Confold and why is he becoming popular? You know? So we'd be in crusaders. We would be fighting the fight. Oh. We still are fighting the fight, but we're not political. Oh. We're anti-political. We're just people that care about the music. But nevertheless, at the same time, you'd be playing at birthday parties of like the German equivalent of Mr. Oakenfold, Mr. Mark Spoon. Mm -mm. No, I would, I, I, you know what? I like those guys, but you, you certainly wouldn't catch me playing their birthday, birthday parties. We got witnesses in this room who've been there. I've never played. I've never played. I have never played a Mark Spoon or a Paul Oakenfold party. Um, <laughs> in fact, the day after, you were sitting in a Frankfurt cafe with um, Spencer. You're making Spencer this shit up. Gemini, uh, Go ahead. Gemini, I think. And I think the original quote was Spencer. Wow. Right, right the very second. When I was playing, Mark Spoon went into the light room next door and he like, I'm not going to use the language he used there because my mom raised me. Mm -hmm. but Go ahead. Man, I got so much respect for a man like that. And, you know, there I was, a little young crusader fighting mm -hmm. for the good in techno and good everything, everything that Mike Banks told us and mm -hmm. everything that, you know, the holy trinity of trans Martin you are. And there you are bigging Mark Spoon up for shagging a bird while you're playing records. I was like, hmm, maybe there's something different behind all this as well. Maybe it's not only the, the true godly kind of thing of being underground or whatever. Maybe it has to do something to do with maybe even the party. Mm. You never would catch my ass playing for the motherfuckers. <laughs> Ain't gonna happen. But this music has always been I've always tried to play it for whoever would listen. Mm. So sometimes you find yourself in situations <laughs> that you don't want to be in. Oh. Uh, I've never played for sultans or, or Saudi princes. Oh. And I have played for one king. And I, I can't really say that was too cool. Oh. That was very interesting to have his guards and what have you there. Any Madonna after parties? Madonna? Yeah. Hell no. No way. Uh-uh. No, I, I, just for those who don't know, this sounds like a didgeridoo, doesn't it? It might just be a drill. Is it, is, are they drilling at this time? Maybe. Didn't they know we're doing this? Well, you know, it's a really productive country. Mr. Howard tries to be, you know... Don't talk about him. Him and Bush. <sighs> Let's move on. Okay. Uh, anyway. Um, no, but I, I, uh, I've always tried to, like, fight for the cause of the music. 
being from Detroit, it's really interesting because in many ways, Detroit is the armpit of the, of the music industry. And I don't mean that in the sense where- In a smelly sense? Or? No, I mean in a sense of, res of respect. Oh. I mean, in many times people, the music industry, other than Eminem and a few artists who've come from the city, they tend to pretty much just look at, the, look at what's coming from Detroit as, as um, a moderate influence. It's a disqualification in a sense. In other words, you know, uh, the city is not sexy, it's not cool, so it can't possibly be coming from there. They don't have any bars, cafes, clubs. Mm -hmm. The people are not uh, sophisticated in any particular way, so th this shit can't be coming from Detroit. It must be a mistake. And this is the kind of situation that be hip hop, be it electronic or whatever you make, mm -hmm. coming from Detroit, you have to qualify, you have to fight hard. You, know? you, have to stand hard. you have to stand up and really put your shoulders back and be prepared to take a hit. And that can, that can take the wind out of you after a while. Jeff Mills, for instance, good friend, he left Detroit because he got tired of fighting for that. He still believes in the music, he still believes in Detroit, but he, he left. A lot of guys, DJ Bone, uh, Blake Baxter, several guys have, have left, but they still do believe in this music. But I mean, even before techno, I mean, you had the Motor City Five, you had the Stooges, you yeah, had rock bands, you had the, you, yeah. you, some hip-hop bands for that matter. A lot of hip-hop artists have yeah. come from Detroit and had to move, up, move out yeah. to, to, to get the opportunity to work with other, other reputable artists. You, know? you were actually born not right within Detroit either, right? No, I was born Detroit proper. Oh. So well, what's this whole thing with Belleville and all that? Who? Belleville and all these parts. Of, can you explain us a little Bell bit? Belleville? Yeah, like different parts of Detroit. And Bell, what's Belleville? Anybody here from Detroit? In the middle of this? Belleville. Belleville, man! Huh. So, sorry, I have to work my Bell, Bell, Detroit accent. He said Bell Hill. No, Will, but you know, we Germans have a problem with the V, you know? BMV, yeah. BMW, BMV. Yeah, BMV. BMV. There you go. There you go. See, Belleville was a little suburban town that I moved to when my mother attempted to save my life. I was a, of the age of 13, I was a young kid, fatherless, and I was just about to get into a lot of trouble. And she did what most mothers would do. She moved me out of my neighborhood, out of the neighborhood, to save me from uh, fucking up. That's it, that's the story. Ended up in Belleville, where there was other, two other kids, where their mothers did the same exact thing, from Detroit. And we became friends because at, at this particular school in Belleville, it was, uh, a really white, not even, I can't even call it suburban. It was a farm town. It was like 5,000 people. It was horrible. So, uh, you know, this is where we lived. And I mean, you know, you could, count, you could count how many people of color, be it Asian, Indian, black, or whatever, that were in the school on one fingernail. You know, it was like eight of us. So we kind of, you know, became friends. And um, that was how I met Juan and, uh, Kevin. Who later became on to know surgeons and pharmacists and... Yes, and all that other yeah. shit, yeah, yeah, that's right. He's being funny again. Come on, yeah. you know, you guys wake up. Yeah. All right. We just tried to get you over the food and all uh -huh. that. Uh-huh, I see. We're on TV, did you know that? Oh. I mean, who isn't on TV these days? But you know, they say you're 10 pounds heavier on when you're on. It'd be two kilos, 10 pounds, something like that. So you and I are looking pretty chunky right there. Yeah, we look pretty chunky, but we're okay. Well, same as the workout, doesn't it? <laughs> we're, a couple, we're a couple chub rocks, but we're all right. We're doing okay. Nothing wrong with chub rock, though. Nothing wrong with chub rock. I don't mind being chub rock. I can be a chub rock today. So, so uh, I mean, how do you go from, like, I mean, you got these people like Juan, Kevin, and yourself there on some high school. In the middle at, of nowhere. I mean, and everyone who's ever been close to the Midwest knows that the middle of nowhere is literally in the middle of nowhere there. Queensland minus people. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, it, was, it probably wasn't supposed to happen by mm -hmm. anybody's standards. I think that's another reason why mm -hmm. it, it caught everybody off guard. Mm -hmm. It first of all came from, from Detroit. We moved back to the city. Mm -hmm. It seemed ironic that we all, we disconnected for a few years. Mm -hmm. And Juan and myself became very good friends. Kevin had went, um, I moved back to the city, mm -hmm. 
at that time and wanted to. Kevin stayed in the suburbs and went to, went, went to university. And I ended up, Kevin had a football scholarship, an American football scholarship, so he played football. I was an athlete, I had track, I ran track. I went to school to run, run track and do all that. And Juan just basically, he went to school and learned music. That was mm -hmm. his thing. And uh, we, we basically all went our separate ways. I, st I kept contact with Juan because I ended up getting put out of school for various reasons, whatever. So I had nowhere to go. I wouldn't tell my mother I was out of school. I, wouldn't, I just wouldn't tell her. So you were like one of these Japanese men leaving every morning with his school fake. bag? And I was a fake motherfucker. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was scared mm -hmm. to tell my mother that I got mm -hmm. put out. I was 18 years old. I was frightened, mm -hmm. to, to petrified to tell her that I'd been put out of school. So there was no caller ID. There was no internet at those, in those days. So she couldn't, there was no way she could tell if I was in school or not. Mm -hmm. So I could, could call her from any pay phone and say, hey, I'm in school, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. She had to believe me, right? What else could she do? She wasn't going to drive five hours up to see if I was there. Mm -hmm. On the holidays, of course, but otherwise, no. So I, um, I ended up uh, moving in with Juan and his mm -hmm. grandmother at that time. And that's really when the connection about the music started. Because what we used to do, and it might seem like some sort of romantic fairy tale, it's not. And I wouldn't even begin to tell you one because you're not here for that. Uh, what we used to do, and this is serious, I don't know if any of you guys can relate to this. We used to sit up almost every single night and we would discuss other people's music. This is before we even were making records. And I'm talking, man, I'm talking 19... I'm talking 1983. <laughs> Who in here was born in 1983? Yeah, I figured that. Okay, okay. So we're sitting up in 1983 listening to, I don't know, be it David Bowie fashion, Kraftwerk, Transurp Express, Sly Stone, Sly and the Family Stone, and Funkadelic, and whatever else was on the radio that was played by a guy named Mojo. And this is at a time when radio was more like you would consider pirate radio to be, which almost doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it was free, in a sense. You could listen to, you could hear whatever the, that particular personality was wanting to play. That was the identity of their show. That's what made their show. And this one guy, really, it, we latched on to him because he came on at midnight to five in the morning. And we'd lie in the bed, man. Juan would face east and I would face west. My feet would be in his face and his feet would be in my face. And we're lying in the bed and we're sitting there and we're like these two kids and we're thinking about how these guys made their records and what they must have been thinking about when they made it, mm. which I'm sure they had no idea what they thought when they were making the music. And we just assumed that they were so deep and so intellectual. And we really built up this sort of impression of what we thought represented or what it took to qualify or to make music. We kind of went way over the limit, but that's what we kind of, we kind of had no other impressions coming from Detroit. There was nothing happening. So we built up this fantasy impression of what we thought it took to qualify yourself to become this, this kind of person, this kind of musician, this kind of, you know, expert. <clears throat> How far did the Mojo's way of presenting the show contribute to that? He used to land a mothership. On every, every at 12 o'clock, he'd land a mothership. Well, 10 o'clock, actually. He'd land a mothership. And um, <laughs> it was a full-blown landing. You know, uh, sound effects, uh, Close Encounters, the soundtrack from the Close Encounters. He'd land the mothership. And then the first record would be maybe a, maybe he, because he had a relationship with Prince and he had a relationship with, with George Clinton from Funkadelic. So they would give him their tracks before they got released. So he would play them. But he wouldn't say who it was. He'd say, you know, his voice, you know, call in and see if you know who this is and all this, you know who it was immediately. But that's what locked us into him. And uh, when Juan made his first record, when he finally made his first record, which was, uh, I think, 1980, it would be, um, well, actually, yeah, 83, Alleys of Your Mind, um, we took it down there. It was just a little 45, and we took it down to the station, and we knocked on the door, and they let us in, and um, we waited hours to meet this guy. Couldn't meet him. Didn't meet him. So finally, I decided, I'm going to meet this man. So I found out where he went after he finished his show at 5 o'clock in the morning. My mother went to work at 7.30 every morning. And I couldn't, I didn't have the right to drive her car, not because I didn't, she just wouldn't let me. But he used to go to breakfast at this place at 5.30 in the morning. And it was just a few miles away from the house. But I couldn't get there quick enough. 
So what I would do is I would steal my mother's car, okay? I actually stole my mother's car every morning and waited one hour and then I hustled back to the house and dropped her car off so that as so she would notice it not moved, waiting for Mojo to show up to give him this record. Well, one morning he finally did show up and I got my mother's car back on time too. Uh, he did show up and I gave him a copy of the record. It was 5, 30, 6.30 in the morning. The people that owned the restaurant said, this kid has been coming here for months looking for you. So I gave him the record, man, and he said, Thanks. That's the way he talked. And um, didn't hear from the guy for like about three or four days. Then we get a call to go down to the station. We meet him at the radio station. We actually had a chance to meet him again. I brought Juan with me. He made us sit in the lobby of the, um, of the, uh, of the uh, radio station and he played the record. And that changed our lives. I mean, really, that one moment changed our lives. And I don't think that exists anymore. That, those kind of opportunities for for an artist, they just don't, ex it's not there. They can't do that anymore. Radio One, Clear Channel, corporate has made it so difficult to, to do anything now, to be creative. It's so difficult to walk into a radio station or to somewhere and make it happen. That sounded like a fart. Somebody farted in here. That, somebody snuck one in on, on top of the construction work, didn't you? <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um. Maybe in a way that was probably one of the first times that you made an actual musical hero of yours. How, f how far did the personal encounter meet your expectations? I think without that encounter, we would not have done what we did. I I'm, mm. I'm sure of it, man. Mm. I'm sure of it. That's why I always greet kids when they come up to me. And I'll tell people, look, I don't remember you. Mm. But, I re you know, but I don't remember everybody. It's impossible. I played, I don't know. Well, every weekend, almost e well, every weekend of the year, mm. in a different country, two different countries, every weekend. Mm. I can't remember everybody, but I certainly try to meet people and give them the courtesy, mm. and give them encouragement if I can. And I think it's really a shame if somebody can't, in this position, can't do that. How do you keep that courtesy and the confidence and all that when you are, let's say, you just got back from Japan, you're playing in Australia tonight, there's this kid who's been waiting for months, paid mm. gazillions of dollars to go and see you, and you're just tired, knackered as fuck, yeah, get yeah. off your decks, and he's like, go, yo, Derek, listen to this. Mm -hmm. You know, I tell you, you just, and I, once again, I'm not perfect, I've made some mistakes, and I'm sure I pissed some people off along the way. Was that construction? Never mind. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure I've, you know, had my made some mistakes along the way, but I, I always fight hard for that. Uh, it's it's important, man, just to stop for two minutes. I've been with some guys who I won't say their names who have been really. I've seen them be rude. I've seen agents. <laughs> I've seen agents be rude to people. I've seen promoters be rude to people. I just don't get it. I don't get it. I really don't understand it. If you ever get the chance to really uh, do something in this business, depending on if you want to be a, if you want to go professional as a, an executive or some sort of administrative position, or if you want to be an artist, don't forget people, you know, because there's some kid in line just like you waiting for the chance. And you got to remember that, you know, because that's the only reason I think that certain art forms perpetuate, that continue, unlike the massive commercial art forms. The underground, the artistic, the alternative forms, they exist because we encourage each other. We kind of lean on each other a little bit. Don't think I don't need you, because I need you. you know? And I always try to say thank you. I even have a MySpace account. I, have, I answer every single one of my own messages. I don't have anybody, I don't pay anybody to answer them. I don't, you know, I do my own. But in a way, all these people that you know, want to get there, I mean, you're clocking their way to the top for like what now? 30 years almost. 20 something, damn near. Yeah, you're always there on the top headline and there's all these DJs who are like, you know, every day in their bedroom and they like training to get that mix perfect. When I don't deserve it, when I no longer deserve it, I don't want it. I used to hate guys that were just, just like uh, pigeonholing a position and they were mm -hmm. bullshit. They mm -hmm. were whack, they lost it. Mm -hmm. You know, they were dragging their balls on the ground. Mm -hmm. These kind of guys. When I become like that, if I, can't, if I can't look myself in the mirror and realize I'm still on top, I, I can't do it. I, I'd be ashamed of myself. How would you recognize? Because you've been looking into that mirror for some 40 odd years now and because you maybe don't. you have to be able to be honest with yourself. I always tell this to every artist that's been on Transmat. 
Uh. Every artist that I come in contact with, I always tell them, look in the mirror. Mm. And if you don't like what you see, look beyond yourself. Look in the mirror. And like, I saw some guys upstairs listening to their own music, pro producing music. I've never, ever been able to dance to my music as I make it. I cannot understand that concept whatsoever. To me, <laughs> Dancing to my own music as I produce it is like blowing my own horn. You know what I mean? It's not quite, it's like, it's like I'm sort of, uh, it's a loaded question. It's almost like I give you this orange and I say it tastes great. Now, you taste the orange and you say to me, damn, this is a nasty ass orange, but how do I tell him it tastes nasty? Because he just told me it tastes great. And I like Derek, he's cool people. And you turn around and you say, yeah, thanks, bro. You'll never get an honest answer, you'll never get an honest opinion, you'll never really truly develop anything if you can't, but that's, you know, if you, if you are so involved in your own thing, you'll mm -hmm. never move forward, you know, and you'll never be able to help people move forward. And mm -hmm. in return, they'll never be able to help you if you don't open up and really give people all you got. Mm -hmm. And this business is all about, you must be prepared to take a ton of criticism. The moment you, go, you go public, you are public. You are, I, I am yours. You are not mine. You are, I am subject to what you think of me, regardless of how I feel about you. It is the business. And once you step out there, once you give your music out, once you attempt to become a DJ or a producer, your shit is out there and you have to accept whatever comes. I mean, you must have heard about every shade of shit that there is in orange. I got some shades now, you want some? <laughs> Later, brother. No, no, but um, I mean, how do, you, how do you deal with it and how do you take that lesson to working with other people? Because obviously, I mean, you said it earlier, you, when you and Juan were there in your room, mm -hmm. it was a pretty easy way to communicate because right. that was your world. Mm -hmm. And you probably developed some kind of language that worked for you. Yeah. But as soon as, let's say, Juan got his record ready, were you jealous? No. No, not at all. I was actually, that's a very good question. I was once, I wasn't even, I couldn't make music at the time. I, I wanted to make music. Juan wouldn't even let me watch him at all. I mean, he, he would close the door for two or three days. We wouldn't see him. you just hear it. You would hear it. You honestly would hear it, but you would never see him. He wouldn't even come out the damn room. And, and he would just produce this stuff. And then he'd come out and he would let you hear the finished product. But he never, I learned from him in, in the very beginning, Never, never, ever blow your own horn. Don't do it. Don't let somebody hear your music. Don't let anybody hear your product or your, 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 your film production or your writings or your creative, whatever it is, your paintings. Don't let any, never say to somebody, I just did this work, it's great, check it out. That's bullshit. How do you never move forward if you think like that. How do you phrase it when you are looking for someone else's opinion? I just finished this. Okay. I'll be back. Okay. No, I... <laughs> that's it. Uh. That's it. And I, you know, that's for you. I just finished it, that's for you. Mm -hmm. Boom. Mm -hmm. I don't have to ask you what you think because mm -hmm. you'll tell me what you think if you decide you like it. If you don't tell me shit, then mm -hmm. I know what you thought. Mm -hmm. Can anybody understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How many people have given up their music here or their production, whatever they do, and asked a friend or somebody they thought they admired or respected, check this out, it's great. Has anybody ever done that by mistake? Because, you know, it happens, right? Has anybody ever done that? Anybody? Nobody wants to put their hand up? Okay, don't do it again. <laughs> Save yourself a waste of time because they'll never be honest with you. People will always bullshit you. They'll never tell you the truth. They'll just, they're afraid to hurt your feelings. They like you too much. You know? What do you do with friends when you know that they could do better and they just didn't fulfill their potential? I, 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 I dog them. I, I, burn, I burn them. I destroy them. Mm. Uh, because I have no time for uh, losers. Mm. I really don't. I mean, I'm, I'm a very competitive person. I don't live on the outside. I live in the middle and mm. I fight hard. I don't take prisoners. So in my camp, if you can't do it, get out. And that's just the way I take it. I am too busy trying, trying to do something. And it's been a very, very difficult process the last 20-something years to be dealing with people that are uh, afraid. 
don't be afraid. If you're afraid to make a mistake, don't, you can't work with me. If you want to take a chance and you fuck up, I can live with that and I'll help you. But if you're afraid, just simply afraid, mm -mm, no time. You got to get over that now. Do you separate work and friendship there? Uh, no, not with me. No, I don't. I can't. I'm unfortunately, I am uh, completely engulfed in this. This is who I am. I live this shit every day. Do you get feelings of loneliness? No, no time for that. That's a tough one, then. I don't have time for that. So what do you have time for? I have time for my two-year-old daughter. I love her. She's amazing. Mm. She steals my heart. Uh, I have time to be constructive to all those that want to learn or understand. But I am not your friend. And I will not be your friend. I will I'll tell you the truth, and you'll hate me for it. But you'll go far. You'll do well. And you'll remember that somebody was honest and told you the truth and saved you a lot of, saved you a waste of time. You know, but you will not like me. You will not like me. But you will truly, at the end of it, you will be a better person for, you know, having somebody told you the truth. Because half the people you work with or half the people you know are just simply just going to yank your chain. Yes, what is a young lady? Yeah, it's funny that you say the truth because that's your truth. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it is. And that's why I'm sitting here. But a lot of people would appreciate your truth. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's not maybe the truth. I would never tell somebody anything unless they asked me. Yeah. You know? In other words, if you want me to work, if you say, Derek, I want to come to Detroit and I want to work with you, I say to you, well, that's a hell of a thing to do. I say, I'm not going to pamper you. I'm not even going to buy you food. You know, I'm not going to do shit. And I'm going to put you through hell. I'm going, to make you, I'm going to make you hurt. I'm going to make you understand what it is to be from my city, what it is to understand what these guys that have made this music have suffered and done, how they've had to work hard for their credibility and to build a standard for what little bit of a standard they have. Let's not fool ourselves. Techno music has, is, by all means, by most people's standards, a piece of shit. You know? I mean, really. I mean, I'm talking about the... The, the, the general impression of electronic music is just, that's some bullshit. That's that eh, eh, eh stuff. I mean, if I went to some, some people outside of this room and just said, I'm playing techno music, they would just like say, oh, great, okay. We'll be there. Sure, we'll come tonight. Right. You know? I mean, that's pretty much what would happen. But if I was explaining, well, it's not that kind of techno thing, and it's this, and I, you know, and I come from... And by the time I do all that, it's, I'm selling, now I'm begging, you know, I'm, I'm pushing too hard. So if you want to come to my city and learn something, if you truly want to become a cadet, in a sense, because that's, that's what it's going to be like for you. Uh, and there are some people in this room that have actually been to Detroit and had to suffer the slings and arrows of, of the outrageous world of Detroit techno, you know, and uh, they've come back better people. But it's, it's not the kind of environment where you, you go and you feel, uh, feel all fuzzy and warm. What's the reason for all the military language in Detroit Tech now? I think because it, my mic just got louder. Did you put, a, you put an effect on it or something? What just happened there? Oh, that's better. OK. Um, I think it's got a lot to do with the fact that um, the guys in Detroit have kind of latched on to uh, they kind of latched on to this, um, well, sort of military support thing. It's just, this, it's just a thing, you know. It's something they feel comfortable. They feel as if they're, they feel as if they're battling the world. Oh. I do too sometimes. So I can't, I can't say outside of that. I think all the guys, I think all musicians, except for maybe Eminem, that come from Detroit now, mm -hmm. feel that way. But he still got enough anger in him to fill that Neumann mic, though. I don't think it's anger. I think it's focused. I think it's a focused sort of uh, determination. I think it's more like being angry. I wouldn't say it's angry. I'd say it's more like I want to prove that I can. That, that this is what it's all about. I'm determined to prove that. But, but isn't clever way of fighting a war a lot more about determination than about anger? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So you answered that question, so yeah. is it this thing is running? Yeah, I don't know what it is. It's a subwoofer, it's making us sound really good. Mm.
we got good voices. Bro, bro, bro. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Sounds sexy like Barry White. <laughs> Welcome to our underground layers. Welcome. Ooh. So, um, there you are, back. Uh, I, I'm still totally, you know, in love with that image of you and Juan and your naked toes and that bedroom listening to music. Oh, you saw it. naked toes. Wait, oh, stop. <laughs> Let me clear that shit up. Pajamas? Let me clear the whole goddamn thing up. Uh, okay. Let me clear this up. Yeah. Big bed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two young guys. Bros, yeah. best friends, yeah. laying in the bed with clothes, listening to music, you understand? Four o'clock in the morning kind of shit, the radio's playing, we're just playing. Yeah. He's laying that way, his head is down there, his feet are down here, and I'm this way, you understand? I ain't got, you know, this, this stuff there. It's not yeah, it's like, like way back in 69. It's Stop all that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, I mean, as we you, say, he's got jokes. No, but you, was, you were really like fantasizing about what these guys took and what visions they had when they were doing this music. And I mean, I guess most of us had that because we didn't open a catalog and knew like, ooh, there's a Moog machine and ooh, there's this computer that does that. Yeah. What were your thoughts? Where did you think this music was coming from? We... Well, I tell you. To hear the first records from Kraftwerk, and this is important, I think, we were never interested in sounding like anybody. We didn't want to sound like Kraftwerk. We didn't want to sound like anybody. We were never interested in duplicating or, or copying anyone's music whatsoever. We felt like it was an opportunity. I, I think subconsciously you, you, you imitate things, you don't even realize it. We all wear, men wear pants, women wear skirts, some women wear pants, whatever the case, some women men wear skirts. But the point is, is that if, at some point we have to, you know, pick up things that are similar in, in some sort of way, form, or fashion. But I think we never went, we never saw it that way. We just, we heard this stuff and it was just alien. You know, and, and I think it, between the age of 13 to maybe 18, you know, it's a really interesting time of discovery with art and music. Mm. I'll use the word art to cover all the boundaries of, of any kind of art form. It's just a really interesting time. Mm. You go from being a little kid and being told no all the time to all of a sudden having this immense amount of freedom between the age of 17 to 20. And all of life is this, is this, is this experience. And then it becomes this music which expresses all of these things that you feel or you think you might feel. And, you, and that's where we were. We were, we were able to, let, to, to, to get our hands on this stuff and it just, it really was the first time we were able to go really outside of everything we had been sort of, uh, our controlled family environments. I mean, I could totally see that a couple of guys from Düsseldorf do look really alien to you if you first see him on the picture. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. It I mean, was you know, the, the, uh, the We Are The Robots cover. Yeah. These androgynous looking dudes. We mm -hmm. didn't even think like that back then. We just thought mm -hmm. these are weird looking dudes. Mm -hmm. We never thought, God, these dudes are, you know, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. We never put that together. We never even mm -hmm. thought like that. We just thought, you know, we put the whole, we put a paramilitary kind of thing to it mm -hmm. or something like that. And that was just it for us. We never went any further. It was innocent. It was all innocent. Can you remember your first feeling when you ever first drove on the autobahn? Ugh. It was too fast at the time. Now I drive too fast. Yeah, it was, uh, it was an experience because I was really looking forward to it. You know, I was thinking, yeah, I'm going to get on the autobahn. you are listening to craft work, all these craft work records and shit like that. I think it's going to be an amazing experience. And it was just fast. It was just a, just a highway. <laughs> It was nothing special. It was cool, but it wasn't that special. Don't want to blow it for you if you're headed towards the autobahn. Um, you're still back in, in that bedroom, and Juan has looked into his room. I mean, he was not going to pick up the guitar or whatever to do his first record. I just spotted a case of itis in this room. Uh. You all right, dog? <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep going. <laughs> now, so, um, how did you guys find out about you know, the technology to 
achieve those alien sounds? I think because uh, Juan had um, a good friend named Rick Davis who um, was really like, he was a Vietnam veteran. The dude was way into like Jimi Hendrix and all this spaced out stuff at the time. And he believed in the book of Revelations from the Bible. Seriously, like he really believed in it to the point where he just So he was the Detroit Techno Hunters Thompson. Rick Davis is that guy, yeah. 100%. So he was the guy who took Juan and um, basically created him. He, he made Juan. Now he gave Juan uh, all the knowledge and the opportunity, but he didn't really want to, he didn't really believe that we had, we deserved it. Like I said, Juan did not show us how to make music. And I say myself and, and Kevin, he didn't show us anything, as a matter of fact, for several years. It was, um, it was very difficult to get him to, uh, to tell us anything. It was a real secret. It was really like sacred. You know, it was, wasn't something that, he sh that you, sh you shared back then. You didn't share this. This was very special. A synthesis at the time, a real synthesis, was not a person that shared this music. They didn't do it. They took, their, they took this work very serious. Now, with the age of technology, you don't, even have, you don't even have to be a synthesis. You don't even have to know what a synthesizer is to make music, which I totally find, I'm, I'm all for technology, I'm all for the future, 100%. But I just find the future not 100% into being creative. You know, the future is not necessarily a creative, uh, sort of, a, doesn't have a creative agenda. But we're becoming less creative, not just in making music, but in everything. So I, I think that was a really special time to actually be able to play a keyboard and make a song. And, mm. you know. Why is this Rick Davis guy so uncredited? And, you know, like the because he never wanted any credit. He, um, and he really went left of all of that. He's still around. He's about 60 years old. Um, I think that um, Juan has been talking about working with him again on a Cyber Cybertron album. Mm -hmm. But overall, I think that he has been very happy with the fact that he, he doesn't go around getting a lot of credit. Mm -hmm. He's got his name on a lot, of, a lot of songs that have been sampled. All the Cybertron material, I don't know if you're familiar with Cybertron or not, mm -hmm. but Cybertron is a Juan Atkins. That's, his, that's his, his, his ultimate project that he did. Almost every single song on the album has been sampled by every major artist in the industry. So I think he lives quite well from that. Hmm. They, they do quite well from Missy Elliott and all these artists sampling their music hmm. over and over again. Did you feel that was some kind of a late justice thing of them being properly paid with that sample being cleared and, yeah, I think and the Ford was, commercial and all that? Uh, yeah, I think that's cool. I mean, hmm. it's, 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 a, it's a roundabout way to get credibility. Hmm. It's same could be said for Strings of Life. Hmm. I made Strings of Life with another guy named Michael James. Hmm. You asked me a question earlier roughly about the way it was made. Mm. I'll answer that in a second. But here's a song that I made almost 20 years ago. It did very well at the time. It was considered a classic the week, week after it was made. But it really only became a true hit last summer, you know, as far as uh, the remake is concerned, mm. which I can't stand. Mm. But if I didn't sign off on it, they mm. would have released it anyway. Mm. So. Yeah, there I'm, must have been some parallel universe because I think for the most of us it didn't even register. It, it, you know, I, I, uh, I can't stand it. I mean, mm. but it's, it's, it, people think it's, look, I was in Hong Kong last week mm. and I had people coming up to me asking me to play Strings of Life. So I played it, mm. my version. And some people came up to me. Which of the 800 versions? No, the, the, the only version, Transmet version. Mm. I played it and um, the girl came back and she said, that's not Strings of Life, that's something else that's been copied. I said, what? I said, what? I can't believe she said that to me. You know, what? Someone. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you didn't have the same thing about your daughter then. No, 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 it's all good. But uh, yeah, you know, no, but honestly though, but um, I ended up giving her my only copy of Strings of Life, which I had. Uh. So I have more in Detroit, but I don't have any more with me. I said, you take this and you listen to it and you compare it to this version that you think is Strings of Life, uh. which is unfortunately called Strings of Life, which I signed off on, uh. which has my name on it. Uh. So, you know. But there's rent to pay, I guess. No, no, I don't have a problem with rent. But, but they would have done it anyway. Or? That's the issue. 
So I, had um, I mean, do you still own the publishing rights yes. and everything to it? Yep, all that. Okay, so otherwise what would they have done? Like they reprogrammed been, it? They or? would have illegally put it out and my name wouldn't have been on it and I wouldn't mm -hmm. have made any money and I wouldn't have been able to do things that help young kids do a record label and continue mm -hmm. to do other things with that extra money. Mm -hmm. So I, I did the right thing, but it hurt to do that. I mean, you know, the artists have to make, as an artist you have to make decisions constantly with your music. You have to sometimes um, sign off uh, decide, compromise, do things that don't agree with what you feel about your music. And that's one of those decisions I had to make. It's not the first time somebody's song has been copied. You hear covers all the time. Most times, 90% of the times, covers have to be approved. And most times, 90, 97% of the times, artists don't want to approve them. Your, your hand is kind of forced when you have to approve a cover. Because if you don't approve it, they're going to do it anyway and you're not going to make any money and somebody's going to be then exploiting you. So that was the situation with that particular song. So it's kind of black slash gray mailing you. Gray mailing you. Mm. Hey, you want to put some questions to these people? If there are any. Anyway. I had a, a, a question I wanted to ask all of you. Mm. Uh, do we have any musicians in the house? Question, what is the musician? I mean, how do you define a musician? Though? That's what I'm trying to find out. Don't ask. Oh, see, you really you messed me up. <laughs> you just killed my punchline. Mm. This guy, this guy, he's Germans, man. They're always one step ahead of you. God, what can you do about them? They make better cars than me, too. Okay, I drive an Audi, by the way, a nice one. Mm. You'd like it a lot. Do you? Very fast. Anyway, um, the reason I ask that is because of the fact that I was trying to find out what do you consider a musician? In other words, is it because you can program music on a, a computer and you have particular programs, you can edit on a particular program, does that make you a musician? You actually can make a good song. Or is it because you can actually play an instrument? And I'm just curious to know, do we have any musicians and how do they feel about the state of programming music, the electronic technological stage of, that we're in now? Do they feel obsolete in any kind of way or left out? No. Yeah. Again. Okay. As long as you're writing your music, you can write it with a computer. You can write it with a guitar. You can you can write beautiful songs and be a crappy guitarist, or you can be barely playing the keyboard, but you're making you're writing music. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's that's a that that's a sort of a collaboration of technology with being an acoustic musician. That's cool. But I'm just curious. What I what my my question is. Is your answer was, was the computer is an instrument then? Yeah, but what I'm what I'm trying to get to what I'm trying to get to is I'm trying to actually find out how many people uh, are actually a, uh, can play an instrument in this room, and how many people are okay, great. How many of you imp implement that into your music, or do you just use the technology? That's cool. Are you collaborating with other artists? That's a good thing, because I feel as if uh, electronic music is just not, and I'm speaking on all forms, not just techno. I'm talking music, period. I feel like we're not at a stage of collaboration, nor are we at a stage of, of um, really uh, using acoustic musicians within the form of uh, the technology that we have. Yes? Yeah, it would have. It's been happen happening for about 10 years. Stevie Wonder did, a, did an album like that once, actually, many, many years ago. It, it, that's, been, that's been capable. You've been able to do that. It's not, it's more, yeah. And, but, go ahead. That's exactly right. But wasn't one of the great things of the liberation of, that came within electronic music and the post-techno kind of ethos that you didn't necessarily have to have like, 1500 years of jazz training to put out a really good record. Yeah, and that's one thing that's a, that's one thing why we were very very selective in Detroit for what we did because we always wanted to make sure that people knew we were playing the music. 
we weren't using the synthesizers or the sequencers or the programs just as a, just as sort of like a, a crutch. It was an asset, but it wasn't the crutch. In other words, strings of life, the piano is real, oh. is performed. The, the orchestra bits that you hear, what I did is I went down to the local orchestra hall in my city, and I had access to, to recording various progressions from the orchestra because my mother has friends within the, the local music community. I was able to go down there when I was a kid and get all these sounds. I recorded them to cassette, and I had had them for years. I put them into an old Mirage and Sonic sequencer, and I still perform them. I actually play progressions on the keyboard to produce the, the, to produce the, 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 the the, the notes that you hear mm -hmm. on the song. Mm -hmm. So it's actually performed complete. Mm -hmm. And that's all I'm saying is I just want, I just would, really would hope that you guys are able to encourage people, be it through MySpace or you send it or whatever it is, to continue to collaborate and play music, not just lean on technology mm -hmm. for the worst parts. It's, it's cool to use it in an advantage like that to team up on a creative level with people, but do not just turn around and become this sort of acidic musician that doesn't have any sort of musical history or quality and you just kind of live, I don't know, just kind of live, um, you're, not really, you're not really attempting to develop or to make anything mm -hmm. that's gonna change or, or make a difference. You're just sort of riding, a, riding the coattails of technology. When you listen, I mean, if we um, dissect Strings of Life as an example, a lot of the feeling and a lot of the energy certainly drives from the DJ aesthetics in there and draws from, I bet, you hearing DJs like Ron Hardy and stuff like mm -hmm. in Chicago and the whole punch in, punch out kind of thing. And like, could you probably enlighten us a little bit about how the actual, actual mixing process in the writing of the track contributes in comparison to, you know, setting blocks on a screen? Right. Any, any of you ever sat down by, uh, to an analog mixing, ca mixing council? Okay. Uh, there is a, a, quite a big difference between an analog console and a, a digital console. Digital consoles, as you do know, uh, you, it's pretty much a, an all-in-one package. Um, you do have certain outboard gear, which would be considered effects units, various different units. Um, but mostly, with a, a digital unit, you've got your software package along with your board, and that's basically how you operate and, and create. You're looking at a screen, you're seeing different diagrams or different whatever, with an analog board, it's actually, you're, you're actually working with your ears and you're working with uh, instincts. It's a tremendous amount of instinct involved with, with making music through an analog process. It's very different. Uh, I, I would like to encourage all of you, if you ever get the chance, to work on an analog board. Actually, get an analog board and hook it up to a digital source. That would be very, very cool. Get the best, the best of both worlds. Stacy Pullen. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of him. He's a good friend and a very good recording artist. He just recently purchased himself an SSL board, and he got it for, I don't know, $7,000. This is a, a million-dollar recording console 10 years ago. You get it for $7,000. It's unbelievable, USD. Try to get your hands on as much analog stuff as you can to implement it into, a tech, implement into, your, into your technology. You'll find that there are advantages to doing that. Don't just... Don't just turn your back on that stuff because it has a tape, it has a certain hiss or a certain amount of uh, resonance or whatever. It's, it's, it's called ambiance in our world, where I come from. That's a good thing. Character. That's a character, that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to hear, to hear a little bit of history from that machine. Uh, but as I was saying, punching in and out, the difference between that and mixing with a mouse is a very big difference. Uh, you have to experience it hands on, as if you, it's so the difference between driving an automatic car and a manual. Mm -hmm. It's a very big difference. Yeah, but then again, you come from a... I saw that. <clears throat> <laughs> You're from a country where people don't like to drive stick, so... I mean, is it probably just us who are trying to be old, retro, romantic kind of people who say, like, okay, we want that human kind of element, and probably it's just a way of, like, hey, let's wake up, it's the 21st century, we're all half cyborgs now anyway, when right. you look at the amount of breast surgery going on and God knows what. Yeah. Like I said, the best of both worlds. There's mm. two. I didn't, I mean, I, you know, I have no problem with technology. Mm. I, just, I just don't recommend that you, you, you lean and depend on it 100%. I think it's, it's too easy. Mm. 
Because I think it's really too easy that way. Mm. Yeah, I mean, um, no, it's just too easy. Uh, it, it's too easy to just roll over and just give it all up like that and not have uh, any kind of, um, not to really use your imagination and find out. I don't want a computer to tell me what I can and can't do. I don't want to have to fight a machine to tell me that I can't do something. And that's the way I feel with a, lot of, with a bit of technology. I feel that uh, when in the mixing process, for instance, when you go to do a final mix, you find yourself um, limited with, uh, uh, with the mastering process of, of, of mixing down to tape compared to mixing down to tape. Let's say um, a two-track recording machine, which is very rare and hard to find these days. The machine is easy to find. What's hard to find is the tape for the machine. The difference between recording on a tape in a mastering finishing process compared to recording to a digital process is, is the difference between us sitting here and being real people and these being holograms. It is completely different. And it, it is, it's like the difference between CDs and, and vinyl. There's a tremendous difference in depth of quality, DB, various things. There, there is a difference, truly. So if you get the chance, like I said, just bring the, both, the best of both worlds together. You know, I'm definitely not saying turn your back on technology. Orange? Oh, yes, please. Um, <clears throat> you probably still are, to a certain degree, you have been living off the respect that you know, little crusaders around the world brought towards Detroit for a very long time. At what stage did that respect become a burden? Mm. I hope it's not burned yet. Um, I don't think it's burned. I think, I, I, think mm. that, I think that we were... Not burned, but a burden. Something burden. that's heavy on your shoulders. Ah. Well, yeah. The heavy part is that people keep waiting for an album from me. That's been going on for, what, uh, like 15 years? Time. Yeah, a long time. Miles Davis took breaks. Hmm. Clinton got drugged up. Hmm. Juan Atkins is chilling. I'll get to it. Hmm. I'll get to it. You know, that's not the issue. I'm actually working on a project right now. We've been hearing that for a while. No, I'm actually working on it, really seriously. Hmm. And I'm going to be doing, the, I'm doing some of the production here. Not in this building, but hmm. in, in Melbourne. I'm working on... Um, there's a movie coming out in Japan oh. for the film Tekken, oh. and I'm actually working on the mixing on that right now. Okay. So I've got to have that done by the end of the month, next month, not this month. I'd be fucked. I just remember you saying like at the beginning of the early 90s, um, I'm just not doing any records anymore because I feel like I don't have anything musically to add to what I've already said. And there was like really mixed emotions towards it because some of the people said like, hey, that's a really brave thing to say. Yeah, it's kind of stupid too. <laughs> or cowardish maybe. Mm -hmm. Could be considered that. Yeah. But I mean, there's nothing sadder than, I don't know, if you look at what Paul Weller is doing to himself these days. What's he doing? Uh, he's just doing the kind of music that 30 years ago he wouldn't have even had the energy to hate the people who do it. Right, I see. You know, I, I, I don't, um, man, the reason I said that is because I had a meeting with uh, some pretty major people about 15 years ago. It was a pretty big deal on the table. It was a major, major, major record deal. And I don't know how many artists get the chance to have a record, to, to get a record deal without any demos. I did no demos. So the deal was on the table for Warner Brothers. It was a serious deal. I had no demos. It was six months into the deal negotiations. Final week of, you know, before I signed the deal, I sat down with Trevor Horn. It was his oh record my God. company. It was his company. Yeah, let me finish the story. <laughs> so I'm sitting there, and Trevor, this is a gigantic table. He's got like this, you know, Knights of the Round table, or whatever shit in his office. And uh, we're sitting there at this table. He's at the other end of the table, tripping. And I'm at this other end, and I feel like I'm in some sort of really bad Federal Express commercial or something like that. Mm. And um, the dude says, so tell me, Derek, as he lights up his spliff, you know, how do you feel about Top of the Pops? <sighs> He's trying to be cool. I said, Top of the Pops. Now, the reason he asked me that is because I can't stand at the time Top of the Pops. I thought it was a whack show. Well, and it's now history as well. It's now history. And the point of Top, do you guys know what it is? What it was? 
Okay, if you're from the States, there was Dick Clark. That was a show that was, they had like the top 10 bands of the, of the week, and they'd have them perform. It was a horrible show. Soul Train was better than that, believe it or not. Uh, in this country, or even England for that matter, Top of the Pops. Really crappy show where the top 10 bands of the week that had the top pop songs, they perform live, this song. But it's a really bad show. It's really, it's, it's embarrassing. So I said, no, I don't want to do that. And I was really fair about it. He said, well, you know, Kraftwerk did Top of the Pops. And I said, really? I was very sincere about that. I said, really? Wow. So, in other words, like, almost like, you know, I, I got to think about that. Hmm. But I think inside his spliff was not weed. I think it was cocaine. Hmm. Because that motherfucker didn't understand a goddamn word I said. Because when I left the meeting, he said I was a lunatic because I didn't want to do Top of the Pops. And the deal was off. And I was very happy that the deal was off because I probably would have uh, burned out years ago. I would have had my moment. I would have made another maybe four or five albums. I would have did this thing. And I would have been miserable inside because I wouldn't have been doing what I really wanted to do, which is be on this level. And I've, I've done very well for myself. I, I'm able to help people. You guys you know, are cool people. It's, it's a pleasure to sit here and talk. I know this guy many years. Oh, I'm sorry, baby. That hurts. I know that's in bad shape, Dan. That's better. So, you know, I'm able to sit here and chill with you guys and do this, because I know a lot of artists have made some really uh, ambitious decisions, and, and, and they're out. You know, and they weren't even able to, to ever reach their, reach their goals. What I don't get about this whole thing is that, obviously, there's always been like a strong affirmation and fascination with European electronics in Detroit. But, I mean, the Transmat sound and Trevor Horn, that's like totally opposite polars. Not really, because he felt, Trevor Horn, if anybody here is familiar with um, Art of Noise or mm. Frankie Goes to Hollywood or Propaganda, mm. all that stuff, that was nice stuff, man. It's still today, it's, I mean, when I listen to that, it's like mm. I just have to sit back and just turn on the surround and just check mm. it out, man. It's just beautiful. Mm. The way they layered it, and the, tech, the, 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 the technical sort of EQing and just the amount of time they put into that sound. Technology-wise, I mean, it's it was in, It was on point yeah. at that time. Couldn't Without a touched. doubt. But then, on the other hand, I mean, what many people were so relieved about with Detroit Techno was that it somehow incorporated some sort of a post-soul Minimalism it. to it yeah. at the time, yeah. yeah. Well, we, we didn't want that sound. But we felt like he was one of the few people that understood electronic music. Mm. And that's why we, were, we, we gravitated to the man. Mm. We went to him because we felt like this dude understands electronic music. And that would make sense. Mm. There was no other record labels at that time that had that kind of juice mm. that would give you the kind of freedom to make the music you wanted to make. Mm. What was and the top first time you ever went to Europe? Oh, man. Uh, it would be... Um, 1989, and I went and I played a party. Actually, no, I didn't play a party. I went, I did a, I met, um, oh, what's Roland's last name from uh, Fine Young Cannibals? I can't remember, I think you know what I'm talking about. Met him and mm -hmm. did a mix for, for one of their songs. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was the first time I was ever in a gigantic big studio. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. I had never seen an SSL board. I had never in my life seen all those EQs and all those outboard pieces of equipment. I didn't know what the hell was going on. I had to actually fake it. I winged it, you know. So what I, did you work on before? Oh, man, I, I, we had a Tascam, you know, mm. those 16 tracks, Tascam, or a uh, little eight track Fostex. Mm. That's all we worked on. That's what all were we, the pieces of gear, the actual like? Yamaha, mm. Roland, and mm. Chord keyboards. Mm. Mm. Corks sequencers, rolling sequencers, rolling drum machines, rolling drum machines, and rolling drum machines. That's right. Did Roland ever pay you any sort of respect of, you know, like rejuvenating them? Met the guys in Japan. Mm. Nice guys. Cheap motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't give me squat. <laughs> Nothing. I said, hey, you know, we revolutionized your shit. We took your shit to the next level, dog. It was because of us that people are done with your shit today. Arigato. <laughs> <laughs> Give me some shit. <laughs> Nothing. 
Not a goddamn thing. Hmm. Motherfuckers. Hmm. But that didn't mean I didn't like the machines anymore. It's like when you meet your favorite actor or whatever, and he's an asshole, and he's no longer your favorite actor. That wasn't the case with Roland. Hmm. Still love them today. Hmm. You know, they just, it just, it is what it is sometimes with certain situations. I think they were truly appreciative of the fact that we were able to have sort of uh, given, their, given their instruments that kind of... Uh, Second, third, and eighth wind. Yeah, you know, qualified it with every single musician that makes electronic music to a degree. But I don't think they understood exactly what we did. And that comes from, once again, that goes back to coming from Detroit. Hmm. And not having the kind of, um, not having the kind of well-oiled sort of machine that you need to make it work. You don't have to be super corporate, but you do need to have your business sense together in this, in this industry a little bit. You do need to have um, some idea of what you're going to do if you are going to make a record on your own, if you're going to become an independent artist, how you are going to promote yourself, how you're going to make it work. So that you, when you get the opportunity to meet some of these people out here, you actually have a product and you have a way to make them believe you also know how you can intertwine or relate the, their product with your product. That's how, it, that's part of making this thing work. You know, it's not just about making great music. It's very simple to make a great record. It's very difficult to make uh, a great situation so that it turns into other things. And you are not under control, which all of you obviously don't want to be. That's why you're here, right? Um, can you give us any sort of sense of how your sense of business changed between or before and after the infamous techno compilation? Well, we didn't, we, we used to sell about maybe like between, I'd say, three and 5,000 records a week when it first started out. We used to put them in the trunk of the car, um, with two trunks, um, Kevin's car and a friend's car. I didn't have a car back then. You know, I was stealing my mother's car, of course. And we used to drive, I think it was James Pennington's car. We used to drive from Detroit to Chicago every single weekend with three to 4,000 records in the trunk of the car, and we'd sell them to the record stores, imports, etc. Uh, there were so many record stores in Chicago at the time. Chicago would buy up, and in Detroit, we could sell it. There was a record store called Buy Right Records, still there, as a matter of fact. And we, they would even sell uh, at least seven, 800 a week. We were able to move all these records, come back with money. It was COD. There was no 30 days. There was no 60 or 90 days on the, on the return of the money because the music was so hot because of what the Hot Mix 5 and the Chicago house scene was doing. Farley, Steve Hurley, Chippy, um, all these guys, Fast Eddie, what have you. They, to most of us, these names are dinosaurs. Can you probably open the encyclopedia and tell us yeah. what we would find there? You'd find Marshall Jefferson, you'd find, you know, you'd mm -hmm. find Joe Smooth, and mm -hmm. you'd find all these guys, man. They'd be right there. Those, these are guys that invented house music. Mm -hmm. House music does not come from London. It comes from Chicago. Some brothers made it. They didn't know what they were doing. They had no sense of business or uh, how to build a relationship in business. They went to, to, to London so excited and happy, and they just gave it up. Sort of like blues. You ever heard of Chuck Berry? B.B. King? Muddy Waters? Well, you know, you got, on the parallel of that, you got Farley, Jack Master Funk, Steve Hurley, Chippy, you know, Joe Smooth, Marshall Jefferson, same thing. Anyway, we went there, we sold these records, and we would pick up the money instantaneously, come back with 10 grand, turn it over, buy, we would order more records, in the process, making more records, and that's how we, that's how we made a lot of money. We actually stopped making money once we started dealing with Europe. Mm. That's when it all kind of went pear-shaped. Mm. So what happened then? I mean, they sent off this over this guy, he wrote a story, did a compilation, and then what? What happened was that the, um, we, we, I, got, <laughs> I went over to, to, to Europe on that trip to do that remix for Fine Young Cannibals, and I met a gentleman named Neil Rushton, who would be my agent. Mm. And we actually had some meetings, and he took me to some record companies so they could hear my music, these great demos. New photo, it is what it is, feel surreal, strings of life, I don't know, beyond the dance, maybe four or five other songs that were on this particular little cassette or whatever I had package. 
And um, the execs were on the telephone when I was, my demo was playing. And we never got a proper amount of respect out of anybody. So we just kind of left. And that was pretty much my, the extent of my first meetings with record companies. Mm. And shortly after that, I think, um, I think something happened. One of the records exploded, and then we got a, Neil called us from London and said, you know, they want to do a compilation. Mm. And we put together the compilation, the very last song on the compilation, which no one uh, had wanted, even thought about putting on the compilation, was Big Fun, the record from Kevin Saunderson. It was the last song. I mean, there was like, what are we going to put on here now? We have everything. What goes on here? And Kevin pulls this song out of his, out of his bag. He says, well, I got this piece of shit. So he said, well, yeah, it's pretty bad. Yeah, it is pretty bad. What can, you, what can you do to it? I take it back in the studio and have Juan mix it. So Juan does a mix. They spruced up the vocals and put it on there. And nobody expected for that song to do anything. And here we are five million albums later. And I think that song probably was as important to the Detroit electronic movement as it was to the electronic music movement. Yeah, I was told of by good account of 11 year old somewhere in Europe having like all male house parties when the parents were away and stuff. All male house parties. Uh, uh, so it was pretty close to the Chicago original, right? All male house parties? I guess so, yeah. Well, not quite. No? There were women in these parties, screaming and shaking and kicking their legs, and it was hot. So you had family in Chicago, right? You changed the subject. Uh, Go ahead. No. <laughs> you, you, you get family in Chicago, right? My mother moved there. They, they left Detroit. They got tired of it. Yeah, they, couldn't, they couldn't take it anymore. Detroit is, you know... Mm -hmm. Detroit is not, not a the most livable city. It's not a, well, it's a livable city, but it's not a metropolis. Oh. It's not a metropolis. It is not a metropolis. It is not a place designed for people that want to live a, a lap of luxury. And my mother was at that point in her life. Right. She'd married, blah, blah, blah. Hmm. So um, you got to see a lot of these, those people that we only you know, search out like archaeologists on Deep House pages or whatnot. And you saw a couple of them spin, actually, right? Well, what happened is that I was in Chicago to visit my mom. And I was already really much aware of there was something happening there. And I couldn't convince Juan to come to, um, to Chicago. Mm -hmm. I said, Juan, man, you've got to check this thing out, man. I've, I've heard this music on the radio. It's happening. Juan said to me, man, I'm not into that gay shit. Mm -hmm. Back to the old man house parties. That's right. That's what he said. I'm not into this gay shit. Mm -hmm. I said, bro, this is not gay shit. This is hot. This is, you, you know, you've got to check it out. And he wouldn't come. So basically, that's where our music changed. My influence became more or less what was happening in Chicago than it was craft work or anything else. I became so engulfed with what these guys were doing that I said, I want to go home. And I want to make a piece of music that they will play. I did not want to make a music that sounded like their music. I just said, I want to make something that Ron Hardy, this guy, will want to play. This Who's guy, Ron Hardy for Ron, Ron Hardy is the best. He's dead. I'd, I'd say he probably was the ultimate DJ in, the, in, in, in our in, in period. I cannot explain to you the amount of technical skill and passion and fire that ran through this man. There's nothing like it. I've never heard a person of any, of, of, in any walk of life that played music like that and was so innovative with tape and with editing and with his audience was just this animalistic, which is too much. I can't, I, I, can't, I can't even begin to explain it to you. It's like if I had a ball of fire here, I'd just set the room ablaze. And that's just how, how he was able to do it. I cannot explain it. They're falling asleep. They ate too much. And they sat in the sun and ate. <laughs> you didn't eat, did you? No, okay. You look, you look like you ate. Okay. Might have. I have a couple records with me. I brought some things that are more or less things that I'm playing now, uh, things that I like. Uh, I didn't bring a lot of music. Uh, I also have a CD of a DJ set that um, I did a few years ago, which is more or less uh, a mix of current club music and Chicago music and disco music and Detroit techno. Uh, I can sort of put that on. Maybe and let that roll in the a, background. As a little 
wake up kind of thing. Yeah, wake up, motherfuckers. Goddamn. I mean, when you talk about he was this ball of fire and that glow and stuff, and obviously he paid like the ultimate price for being on fire so much. I have vinyl, by the way, folks, but I'm going to put the CD in because it's a live mix from Japan um, about a few years ago. And I'm just going to let it play. We can continue to talk, or you can listen to it and make your comments as, as we go. And it's recorded with uh, actual microphones within the audience. So you're hearing the party itself. How loud do you want that? Hmm? How loud do you want that? being so energetic. Yeah. Um, you've been in this trade for so long now. How do you keep that fire burning without, you know, imploding like a supernova? You know, I tell Carl Craig all the time. I say, Carl, learn from my mistakes. Learn from my mistakes. He has learned. His record label is phenomenal. Planet E Records. He's a wonderful label. He's a wonderful artist. He works with various projects. I didn't set myself up to be so dynamic. But I made sure those around me are, such as I told you before, I'm hard, I'm abrasive, I'm abrasive. I push these guys, Kenny Larkin, Stacy, Pullen, Carl Craig, I push them hard so that they could do many, many things. They could look way outside the box. And I think that one reason why I'm driven is because I, 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 I'm so locked into this, you know? And the difference is with them is that they're locked into many things. Hmm. I have a very uh, sort of, you can almost say, um, I walk a very tight rope hmm. while they walk on a big net. Hmm. You know, they could spring off and do many, many things. So what, keeps, what, 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 what drives me is that that rope is so tight and so, so narrow hmm. that if I make one move left or right, I slip and fall hmm. and I'm off. So I have to stay on my shit. Mm. What I try to do is mix Detroit, New York, worldwide music. I don't care where it comes from, but I do try to always show an emphasis of where I come from when I play. So that's what you hear. You keep looking at that watch, what? Hmm? You're doing good.
Yeah, not good. Um, this is this, um, I just was reminded of something. I mean, <laughs> your DJing style is very, you know, dynamic. You're just mashing shit up all the time. And uh, it made me think of um, David Mancuso's ideology. Like, mm. uh, I think like the, yours and his are like, kind of antithetical. Like, mm. he seems to be coming from a position now, he states that, like, um, it's a heavily egotistical thing to interfere with, you know, records, to interfere with mixes yeah. and things He's, like that. He leaves spaces between his tracks I now. No, he does. Um, uh, um, you know, I'm just curious to know what your opinion of that is. I think that's cool. I think uh, I think he is a purist uh, by definition. You know, he loves the music first and foremost. Different. I mean, I've had him come to my parties and be dancing. You know, uh, and I think we all I appreciate and love what he does. And it's, in, it's, it's, it's nice to get that back from somebody who you respect, who is not judging you, but would judge others who do it not right. So yeah, I, I see your point there. You got no problem with that whatsoever. If you do it correct, or if you do it and it feels right, and it moves people, that's really what it's all about. And I'll be, I'll be told, without being told if it's right, believe me. See, the audience doesn't have to, they don't have to say anything. If they don't dance, if they don't move, that's everything. That says it all. That says it all. That's why, I don't, that's why you never have to ask people what they think. It, the truth will be told. The truth is in the pudding, brother. It's there. Young lady, to answer your question, the music that you're hearing now is some of it is 20 years old, some of it is four years old. And when I did this, uh, I try to intertwine and bring all forms of music together, old and new. Now the song that's coming in right now is a song that's considered a classic by most people's standards. French Kiss. Can anybody hear that? You know, and uh, uh, it's considered a classic by most people's standards. And I try to show the the sort of innovation of the early shit compared to what's going on today. To show people that it's not all that different when it's done right. When it's done right, it's right, right? Listen to old hip hop records compared to some new stuff today. If it's popping, it's popping. That's it. it. Doesn't make a difference. So that's what I try to do when I play. That's my whole point. So call me what you want, old school, this school, new, whatever. But I, I like to show the, all the connections. Mm. And, uh, I think it's interesting because, oh, hello. Test, yes. Um, to me, techno, or the essence of techno is something futuristic and looking to the future and uh, it's kind of interesting that some music will, might be 20 years old, but it still sounds like it represents the future in some way or shape or form. And um, I'm wondering, do you still look for music that sort of is pushing forward or is trying to break some, yeah, some I kind do. of mold? Or? I do, and I find it more and more difficult every day. That's a very good question. Uh, the fact that vinyl is, which is amazing, in less than two years become almost extinct, People have just rolled over and just fell for the okie doke and everybody just stopped making vinyl. You know, and I knew it was coming and we all knew it was going to happen, but it's just been really sudden. It's not like uh, I wasn't prepared for it or anybody wasn't prepared for it, but God, it happened quick. So it's, it's become very uh, interesting times for music. I think that you might imagine it's a really free and open time to make records, but I think actually it's a dangerous time because the more, seed, more people make downloads and the more CDs that are available, the less people seem to be listening. The less people seem to be concentrating on searching out and seeking good music. They're just searching out quantity, not quality. That's, the, this, that's what makes it dangerous. It's the, it's the quantity aspect of it. The quality should always be number one. But you're not getting quality because you're not able to find it because there's nobody out there sitting back telling you this is the hot record of the moment, this group is the new group of the moment. You're being told now by 
by Viacom and uh, Radio One and Clear Channel that you know MTV is telling you who your hot groups are again. They now have control again. It's really interesting. We've kind of given up that little aspect of our control on a creative level by um, sort of falling in line indirectly. But then again, I mean, if you that's why MySpace is important as well. Even though it's corporate, it's still it's still got a it's still very much at the moment still locked into youth culture, which is very important. Okay, um, the Murdoch, MySpace discussion a little. I didn't later, say probably. Murdoch. A little, but um, if you if you think back of on how much time you invested in doing a radio mix, with all the edits and all that kind of stuff, and you know that culture with you mentioned the, the people in Chicago, you mentioned people like the Mojo, the Wizard, you yeah. didn't mention, but you know all these people that that invested so much time in just getting like half an hour or one hour of radio mm -hmm. to be something incredibly unique. But I don't, uh, think, they, I don't uh, think anybody did it to be sitting here today. Uh, you know what I mean? I mean we, did you do what you did to be sitting here today? I can't think that much forward, you know? Right, exactly. So, but, but, th but then again, I mean, isn't it a, probably a good thing that, I mean, if w Wajid over there was going to do the same kind of thing this afternoon, mm -hmm. he'd be able to have like, the chance to distribute that to like, finding all these kids wherever around the world. And he doesn't want to. It's so weird. It's, mm -hmm. it's a good question. He doesn't want to, for instance. Uh, I, I, I saw Mojo recently. Yeah. I said, man, you should get back on the radio. You got, you've got satellite radio, all these things. Uh, I don't want to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. I've done it, man. Mm -hmm. you know, and I understand that. Are people afraid of the pressure again? No, I think that you can't. I think that it's kind of, it's, you, you get magic in the bottle once. Mm -hmm. You don't go back and try to capture it again. You don't even know you captured it. When you get magic, you don't even you you don't know you got it. You just got it. You don't try to you don't try to grab something that you don't you, you don't know how you got in the first place. You just run with it. And you run with it until it runs out. That's why you say about me doing this and you know, when do I realize I I, I when do I know my time is over? Mm -hmm. My time will be over when I when I I'll look in the mirror and I'll know. I'll know, because I won't, I won't wake up hungry anymore. Hmm. You know? But right now, I'm severely hungry, with full of desire. Hmm. You know? Desires for what? I'm full of desire. I'm still full of desire to play and to be around young people. And to, I'm 43 years old, and I'm still very much into this. I love it. You know? I love it completely. I, I couldn't imagine doing anything else right now. I mean, I do a lot of things. I mean, I work with a lot of different projects, but I really love what I do. And if you don't love it, if you become jaded and it becomes some sort of, you know, just thing, then get out, move on. You're wasting space. Like you said, am I holding up space or do I ever think of myself as holding up space for some young kid who's hungry climbing a ladder? I try to help a lot of those guys so that I am not holding them up. And I love the challenge. Bring it on. So it's a similar thing as, let's say, in hip hop. If Dr. Trey is too busy doing things, he would let like Scott Storch do a beat, and he should. And well, if he, he did. If that's good. That's what uh, he and then do. later on, but I mean, you know, this whole system there that you have to, you know, work for someone in the studio first, and you don't get any credit, and then later on you will become eventually the credit, and you can always say like, look, I worked on this and that. Is there like a similar system in techno as well? Well, yeah. We, I mean, Mike Banks, for instance, has always went out of his way to. He's got a gigantic building, you know, uh. and he's, it's open to everybody. Uh. He's always trying to help people. Uh. He wants to make sure that people get the opportunity to make music and do things. Uh. Uh, the boot camp. The boot camp. And uh. that's, why, that's where it comes from. Because uh. it, that's why I say, you know, you can come to Detroit and you could hang out with us. Uh. But it, it doesn't just happen because you're there. Uh. And I, I remember Melbourne always being a really interesting place for electronic music. It was always like, to me, a kind of like a, um, I felt there was a, a real sort of passion here of where it was oh. about to explode. Oh. I think, I think polit promoter po politics kind of got in the way a little bit of oh. what has happened here. Oh. But I think the fact that we're sitting here now says, you know, says that it still can happen. Oh. It's still trying to happen. You can't really squash creativity. Oh. You can sort of oh. push it back for a minute, but it's coming anyway. Oh. A revolution is a revolution, small or big. Mm. Any questions about anything? 
Uh, I was going to ask, I mean, obviously what you guys did at some point was uh, <clears throat> exported to Europe and took on a life of its own. I want to know what's, what's your whole opinion on, you know, what's been happening in Germany over the years and, you know, in recent times, the whole minimal thing, which, you know, if you listen to music from Ricardo Villalobos and Richie Horton is, is such a far, far cry from, you know, what was, what was this pulse coming out of, of Motor City? Not necessarily. Good, that's a good point, though. But first, to answer your first part of the question, Germany. In the very, I'd say, back, oh man, I have to say 89, because Germany was a place I was visiting with Jeff Mills quite a lot. And we were in Berlin all the time. This is for, before Berlin, before the wall was down, of course. And um, we were playing E-Work and all these clubs there. The wall was still up, was still down. The wall was still up. No, what? Uh, no, the wall was down then. Yeah, but the sure, before cut, that, yeah. The final cut time was yeah. when it was still up. Yeah. yeah, we played all these different clubs over there, and then we eventually, when the wall came down, played E-Work, and E-Work's a very cool place to play. But the sound, I think that what's happened in Germany is very much um, tied to Detroit. For instance, uh, the basic channel guys, they basically called Detroit home away from home. And they're basically responsible for the complete minimal sound. Uh, Moritz and Mark, nice people. Uh, they bought a building right next door to my building, you know, as to be close to the sound, not once again to imitate it or to copy it, just to be close to, that, to the energy that created this thing, to know what it is. You understand? So when you go deep sea diving, you don't want to be a fish. You may want to be a fish, but you know you can't be a fish. But you certainly want to see how they live. You certainly want to experience it and appreciate it and be able to take those experiences back to wherever you come from. And that is exactly what they did. And it took them years to be able to uh, really make, establish that sound. And most people don't even realize that Basic Channel is responsible for the complete minimal sound in Germany. You know, uh, Richie Harden, He didn't have the happiest times in the beginning in no, Detroit either, right? Not at all. Oh. No, Mark had some, some pretty rough times. Oh. Um, I mean, and Richie too, but with being from a you know, white some, kid from the other side of the Richie river. Richie had some very difficult times. Richie was not, not welcomed in Detroit in the beginning. He was really hated, completely. Uh, Mike Banks threatened him. They were going to break his neck. They didn't want him around. The only one who liked Richie at the time was Kenny Larkin. And uh, that was it. And Richie fought, though. Got to give him a lot of respect. He fought. He made, him, made, him see, he made people respect him. And that's a very difficult thing to do. But the minimal sound, to answer your question, it was a sound that did get its roots in Detroit. Very much so. Very much so. And what's happening in Berlin now is a definite connection to what happened in Detroit. And that's why... Richie, Magda, and all these other artists from Detroit have moved to Berlin. So what's up with Rob Hood? What's happening with Rob Hood? Go on Google, I don't know. I imagine he's okay. Moved to Houston, moved to Texas, didn't he? Oh, and last thing I heard, he was in Vienna and then... Uh... Bought a big ass farm in Texas. Or oh, Alabama, actually, I'm sorry. He bought a farm in Alabama. Probably been listening to Martin Luther King for a while. Right? I think so. He bought a farm in Alabama. I can't tell you what he's doing on that farm. He could be raising, you know, a techno crop or something. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what he's doing. But Rob is, um, he's good people though. I don't know what he's up to. Come on guys, you must have something to talk about here. I was, I was wondering if you could... Okay. I was wondering if you could kind of help paint a picture of Detroit. For those who have never been there, I mean, when I hear Strings of Life, it's almost like a theme song for the city. Mm. If you ride through the city, you could kind of feel like, I just want, I just want, if, if you can, put into words, like, what Detroit is for you and what it means to you, and most of all, why you're still there. You know, it's interesting. Um, I barely, I, 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 I've rarely ever meet any people from Detroit that know anything about the music that we do, you know. I mean all the music. Mike Banks is this, as we call, as we call him, he's his high yellow brother. 
I mean, he's banana yellow, but he's as black as this damn machine inside. I mean, he's like this militant black dude. You know, you just, you have, you have to meet, you have to know him to know him. But I think the music is so much, it's so much pain, it's so much anguish. When you ride through the city, it's like a, oof. I, I, you know, I'm gonna try to explain that because that's a good one, that's, that's really heavy. When I made that song, I was actually almost in tears because I made, it out of, I made it out of pity for my city. I felt so sorry for my city and the people. I felt this sort of, this sort of dream that might never come true, you know what I mean? I think that was really, um, it's almost like the finish line that you can't cross. And that was really why I made it. When I did it, I realized why I did it. I used to look out the window of my little apartment in this area called uh, Wayne State, this little university I lived there. And around me, thank you, around me was um, really desolate. Behind me is Cass Corridor, it's an area called Cass Corridor at the time. It still is a bit beat up, but at the time it was very run down. No, no outlook whatsoever. And I tell you, the people of Detroit are great people. They're just like people in any other city. They want good things. They want their children to have good schools. They want decent supermarkets. They want, they want life. They want good life. But it's just, it's a really, these are some dedicated people. And why I stay there is because I think I'm, I think I, I think I'm, I'm stuck. I think I can't get out the mud. I think I'm so passionately, I don't want to be there. I hate it but I'm locked into this place, I cannot leave. I don't know what it is that will not let me leave. I try to leave every time, and they just pull me back. You know, just like the movie. It's true, I cannot get out of there. And it's, it's very difficult to understand that. It was very difficult for me to express that or explain that to you. It's very difficult for me to express what I felt when, I, when, when, when Strings of Life was made. It's very difficult, but it's a, it's a soundtrack to sadness. It's like if you saw Eminem's movie, Eight Mile. You probably saw some scenes in the film that you probably thought were uh, props or maybe just over exaggerated. I actually think they were quite nice about the film. I think they held back quite a lot. You know, I think they really could have went much further into showing you a core, uh, a complete um, city that's damn near had a Holocaust. There was a war in Detroit in '67 and '68. It was an actually it was a two-day war is the only time in America, other than in Ohio, that the US military has fired upon its own citizens with weapons. And they actually had tanks in the city. They shut off tank rounds, you know, killing locals. And um, the city has not been uh, properly repaired since those days. And then people burn down different parts of the city from time to time. Uh, but like I said, the people of Detroit are good people overall but they're stuck. I'm not stuck because I wanna be, I'm not, I'm not stuck because I can't leave. I'm stuck because I'm compelled to make a difference. I can always leave. I just feel like I need to be there for a reason. I just hope I don't get trapped there. You, know. you full of questions, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. I, we do want questions, right? Yeah, sure. We want questions. Again? How do you think the city was affected by all the immigrants coming and selling their soul to the, to the car companies? Because that's what they did when they came there. The, the car company, the company they worked for controlled everything. I think people came there such as they came to Melbourne, such as, they, such as yeah. Greeks went to, mm. to Italy, such as the Turks went to Germany. But many, 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 many different nationalities coming True to that. one place. Mm. True that. Not so long ago. Yeah, but, but, How but, do you think that but thing? most of the people that came to Detroit, I think they were there before the, before the car companies. I think most of the black people actually came for the car companies. I think most of the people that, that were there before part, that. Part of the Underground Railroad. Exactly, I mean. they were all part of the Underground Railroad. I yeah. think that most of the people, that the immigrants that came there, came there uh, well before then. They had established themselves. Detroit is a very old city at the, you know, in American standards, 300 years old. You know, I mean, we all know that's not very old. If you come from Europe or anywhere else other than Australia, you would know that that's not very old at all. 
uh, or New Zealand, which is as young as Australia. But uh, uh, I, I think that mostly, most of the people that were the true immigrants were, were the black people that came from, with their first opportunity of freedom. Because the Germans, the French, and what have you, they more or less conquered the land. So I can't really answer that on their behalf or how they might have thought of it. Because I know why black people came there. They came there to work. That's it. The two Greeks and from Turkey and Germany, and, but also <clears throat> a lot of poor Italian. Well, you might know more than I do about that. And I'll tell you why, because my, my, um, my belief about Detroit and the Greeks in particular is that they were invited to come there. And there was, at one time, the, the, we, we had the largest Arabic population outside of the Arabic world, like next to New York, living in Detroit. And I, have, I, don't, I don't really believe they came there with the same intent. They had their own ambitions for work. They didn't come there with the automotive industry as their backbone. They came there with another, another sort of passion. So I, I can't really... I mean, it was considered the Old West before that already. It was, yeah. yeah. Like, well, it was actually quite a sophisticated yeah, city. People were speaking yeah. French in Detroit, yeah. you know? I mean, it was, you know, it was a very cool place to be if you were French or if you were, you were Canadian. But it was a tradesman city. It was on the port. It was a port city. People came in and out on the boats all the time. So, yeah, but I cannot... Answer that question. <laughs> anyway. I did my best. Um, hello. Um, the Deep Space DJ Collective, you were part of that? Like in like Detroit early on, was that you? Like, yeah, it was myself and Juan Atkins, Deep Space yeah, Soundworks. Yeah. Can that you talk a bit about, about the party scene when you were playing out then, we, early we, on? We would just rent a venue like this, bring it up, put the speakers in the back of the trunk, put the turntables on a, um, you know, the car, records were in milk crates, and we would charge a hundred bucks. And we'd play for people. And Juan would let me play 15 minutes. <laughs> and he'd tell me to get off the turntable. <laughs> and like, who was part, I mean, who was coming to these parties and what kind of music were you playing? Oh, these were kids our age, high school kids. The parties were quite sophisticated. People put together some really nice flyers. Promoters were 16 years old, making really very good money. Those these were the guys with the, with the jackets and the buttons. Snobs and, and Chapatino kind of and this whole thing. Yeah, it was very sophisticated, very like, uh, very professional high school kids putting on really, like, parties at country clubs. They'd rent a venue like anybody else, you know, uh, and um, hire a DJ based on certain stipulations, music you played, what kind of person you were, whatever the case was. And they would um, have you play their parties. And we became cool with the cool, with the so-called in crowd, and that was our first real encouragement to, to play. But Juan would let me play 15 minutes and kick me off. I'm serious, 15 minutes, you say, that's enough. And then he would pay me like 20 bucks. And I carried all the equipment. It made me feel terrible. But I was his, I was his protege. So he treated me like I was his protege. Um, when it comes to presentation, obviously there's a lot of different approaches as well, even among the core figures. Let's say the whole Mike Banks approach of you know, going all military and while you'd be taking your shirts off at any possible stage during the DJ set. I didn't take my shirt off. Oh, you did. You've never, you show me, show, you think you can sneak some shit past me, don't you? <laughs> That's some negative. I don't take my shirt off. I have never, show me one picture where um, I took my shirt off. We got one upstairs you if ain't you got want no one. damn picture of me taking my shirt off. Do, do you want to see it? We yes, got one upstairs. I want to see it. When we get done with this, we'll go upstairs and take a look at this picture. It's with up me. in the back. You may see me with a couple buttons down, Tom Jones style, but you never see me with my shirt off. <laughs> That is not happening. I want to see that picture. Show me, show me the picture. I'm going to fabricate some Photoshop Natasha shit. Clothes. I want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, next question. Next question. So. I want to see it. But um, nevertheless, you were a lot happier with, you know, like presenting yourself and putting oh, yourself wait, wait, out wait. there. No, wait, wait. Are you talking about the picture in Music Magazine with my shirt on? Uh, well, the only one we had, we would have. Well, I'm riding the bull. Demo. No, there's, there's one in Jockey Slot in like 95 or so as well. 
my shirt off. It's like very open, and but we have no, seen you. No, that was you. a Tom Jones a look, man. <laughs> <laughs> and there's at least three people who've been in here earlier that have seen them with their own eyes. I've never had my open. fucking shirt off. Well, whatever. But um, generally, you are, you know, <laughs> it's a slightly different approach to go all out there and say, like, here I am, I present this. You come to see me play as compared to, like, Oh, I've, I've never been like that. No, no, huh. no, I can't be like that. It's impossible. Yeah. 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 So, but I've never had my shirt off. Huh. <laughs> I mean, if I had my shirt off, I, you know, I don't even, I don't do drugs. I'm not, a, I've never done drugs. I've never even smoked a joint. Hmm. So I do not huh. recollect my shirt coming off unless it was ripped off by some woman. Uh, now we're trying to find the loopholes here, right? <laughs> I see. Um, Speaking of loopholes, like, um, what's the big, big fascination with Detroit Techno on strings? Ah, orchestrated strings. Yeah. Well, it's part of the soundtrack. That's by the way he was saying to me before. Uh, what you know? How do you explain? Can you you know define Detroit and strings of life and how that song represents or speaks of the city? I think this. I think. For us, it's the, this part of the soundtrack and part of the, the, the whole sort of what thing we see and feel in the city is this saga, this ongoing sort of melancholy. Uh, melancholy, that's another thing. I mean, there's always that happy, sad, bittersweet kind of thing. That's Detroit. It, it mm. is like that. It's like always like a, this ray of hope and it always falls down. But what's it like being like a bittersweet, melancholic city in, in a city or in a nation that's obsessed with the pursuit of happiness? Detroit's not obsessed with the pursuit of anything. Uh. I think Detroit is uh, a city where people are angry, unemployed, and they're just trying to figure out how they got in this mess to begin with. Uh. You know, I think Detroiters, show me the picture. No picture, you see, I told you. See, he was, he was thinking he was going to show me the picture. I want to see this picture. We'll get back to the question in a second. Show, bring me the picture. There's no picture. It's love fun, yeah. Show me the picture. No German in this room, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What do I have here? He's got nothing. But then again, you know what? Oh, Jesus Christ, man. That's not a Sorry. naked picture. I know this picture. OK, that's Tom Jones. That's I Tom Jones. Wait a minute. Hang on. You see that? That's Tom Jones. Tom but Jones in 1995. Give me a break. Um, we could, I mean, that's, that's just the printest ones, but I mean, what's the bet here? I know Nick loves a good bet. If we'd get for you a picture of you DJing with your shirt off within 48 hours, what would you bet against it? Uh, buy everybody in here dinner. Whoa. <laughs> okay. It's something to turn on, but that's a very good Tom Jones look, yeah? No, it's actually quite bad. To be honest with you, I, had, I didn't expect to do the photo shoot. I was pissed off and I was saying to the guy, look, man, I don't want to do the photo shoot right now. He said, oh, it's all right, mate. Only going to take a couple quick pics and get you out of here. <laughs> and I did it and I was like, this is not happening. So, put that away. But that's probably a good, good kind of exercise of like, how to not deal with English journalism. Because, um, I mean, there's like a really fun picture with like a lot of really good things that you're saying. Yeah, I've had to be criticized by that, those words quite often. I mean, I say some things in there about women, which I wouldn't say today. Oh, yeah. Oh, I wasn't talking, referring to them, not at all. No, yeah, well, no, you know, no. I, I remember for that. I made mean, a lot of comments down here. I mean, what do you do if there's this guy there and try, just trying to, I mean, they're basically just trying to get dirt on people from you, right? Well, they tried to. They wanted to have me say bad things about Claude Young and Richie and Laurent and Rob yeah. Hood and Mike Banks, Kevin, Juan Atkins, Dan Bell, Kenny Larkin and Dave Clark. Uh, what did I say about Dave? I don't know Dave so well, but I just recently saw him in the south of France. I think Dave wants to be a pop star. Uh, nothing wrong with that. I could be wrong, but I get that impression. I like the fact that he says what he wants. I think it takes a lot of balls to have an attitude. I give him respect for having balls. I think my favorite one is like um, Laurent Gagné. I think a lot of people completely misunderstood Laurent. 
He's arrogant, he's pompous, he's a handsome man, he's French. He knows, he knows what he's talking about. He's a good DJ, he's good money. He's got money, he makes blah, 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 blah. And I'm just trying to contradict, contradict, let contradict. Let me read it, let me read, yeah. let me read it right. Like, you gotta I mean, read it, you gotta read it right. No, but I mean, uh, what, how do you fare with these things? Because I mean, ideally, a lot of these people will at some stage be, will be confronted with these kind of things. And I mean, you cannot, can end up and shit with people that you really, really know and really respect. Yeah, true. So self-defense self tricks have and any techniques. Of you ever, have any of you ever went to hear a DJ or perform, an artist perform and they really disappointed you? I mean, just really like, and you try to, you know, maybe they said something to you that was rude or you felt like, man, it wasn't really appropriate. It was no reason for that. And you just really lost respect for them. You tried as hard as you could to, buy their next album or support their next project and just couldn't do it. So you all basically love every single person you've ever met. <laughs> Talking about the, um, what Tilson brought up with the, um, the British journalism thing. Do you think to a certain degree that somewhere along the way techno got a bit too over intellectualized by the British journalists and in particular what you yourself Juan and that were doing? And no, I don't think so. I think, uh, I think that's it's a, the total opposite actually. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's a total tabloidization or something like that, right? Yeah, I, I think that uh, in the beginning, we were really happy with the support we were getting from the media. Uh, I think that uh, somewhere they, they just decided that they had enough of us, you know? And um, they had their own crew. And that's when, they really ex that's when it really exploded. When Aphex Twin and the, all the guys came on the scene is when it just became truly cool to make electronic music. Before that, we were just, the, we, we, we didn't realize that we were the, we were the prototype set up artist for the whole thing. No, no regrets though, I tell you, because I'm sitting here now with you, so I cannot say there's any regrets. Questions? Gentlemen over here. Hi. Hey. Um, could you explain the term high tech soul? Of course I can. High tech soul is a more or less a, a, a I'd say a, an offspring of, of techno music. I think the original concept of what we always wanted people to understand what we were doing was black electronic music with soul. We never wanted to be um, sort of pigeonholed, you know, sort of. When we saw techno go south, really south. We really saw it become something else. We just didn't want to be a part of it anymore. But we just couldn't walk away from what we created, right? And we didn't create it alone. It took everybody to make this thing happen. So we fought. We fought hard. We fought to keep, it, keep some credibility and respect in it. But it became more and more difficult as you found yourself with some of your own guys, you know, playing the same bullshit that other people were playing. So uh, the fight has been to, the cause has been to, to, to take it back to where it originally was from, which is the, the soul of the music, the essence of it. The essence of it is that it was high-tech soul. Good answer. Thank you. <laughs> Do you think you can survive today with being just a brilliant minded producer alone, or do you really have to go out gigging? Gigs? Yeah. Gigs are great. Gigs, unfortunately, also eat you. They eat, yeah. they eat you up. Anybody here performing on a basis at all, ever? Okay. DJ or music? Performing vocal or musicians? Vocals? DJ. DJ, 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 DJ. DJ, okay, cool. Anybody playing tonight or tomorrow? Okay, cool. Sad, all right. Cool, he's... <laughs> what time? Okay. See, he's, he's getting nervous. He already needs to go to the toilet now. Hey, like... He should go to the toilet. That's a good thing. It's huh. a good place to concentrate. But, uh, but not a public toilet. Huh. Anyway, um, uh, how long are our sets? How long will you perform? How long? Mm -hmm. How long will you perform tonight? A few hours. Who else? One hour. One hour session. For 48 hours. 48 hours, okay. 
That man is that man is gonna be on some drugs. Okay, anything else? <laughs> not, oh, I thought you said forty-eight hours. Okay. Well, it, it unfortunately is possible. <laughs> There's a man out there that does it all the time with a funny looking face, he wears baseball caps and he's on a lot of drugs. Anyway, um <laughs> I won't say his name. Anyway, um What was the fucking question? The whole thing is like, how do you keep on maintaining that energy and the motivation? Yeah, to I was headed towards that yeah. thing. That's what I was headed yeah. towards. Yeah. Um, is to not, first of all, don't, I don't uh, put myself in positions where I'm not enthusiastic about the sets. Hmm. Number one, if I'm going to do gigs, and I do a lot of them, to, to, to perform music, uh, to actually go out and do a live show and perform it, I haven't done that in years. Hmm. I've been DJing all the time because... Um, I love to do it. I've always been good at doing it, and it's something that I, I can be in direct contact with people with. But being in the studio, if I was to go back in the studio, which I'm doing now, but this is a special production I'm doing for this movie thing, but if I was going to go back in and make an album, I would stop making music, stop playing records altogether, because I can't make, I can't play music and make music. It, you, I, I have to cut one off. I, I can't do it. I can't make music for two or three hours. Turn off, the, turn off the gear and come back tomorrow. I have to lock in. It's, it's lock in, get it done. I cannot walk out that room until it's done. Anybody like that here? That's, yeah. How many of you turn it off and come back to it? You gotta, you gotta stay in that room. You gotta lock down. You, gotta lock, you really gotta lock down. And then you have to work on it so much to the point where you get tired of listening to it and then you don't listen to it. And then you turn it back on and you hear all the shit you did right and all the shit you did wrong. And that's when you know you did something. But don't dance and think you just made some great shit. Let others be the ones to tell you you made some great shit. You just make it. You just make it. What does it take these days for me to get on Transmed? Money. Drugs. Women. Is it that easy? Wine. Okay. That bit I could be outsorted easily, yeah. You can get me all the pornos you can. Well, but is that all? I mean, is it that simple? Are you crushing all your idealistic little crusaders, Detroit Techno dreams now? Hmm. Well, you could extend the warranty on my car. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, label policy. <laughs> no, to, to, be, to, work with, to work on the label of Transmat, what it would simply take is uh, we listen to every demo. Uh, the, the company, we took a break, because I put on a festival a couple years ago, a big one in Detroit called Movement, and it's quite a large festival, and it really uh, took a lot out of my company. Which is a plethora of stories in itself, Yes, I it suppose. is, but huh? the, the, end, the end result is debt. Hmm. <laughs> Serious debt. But was able to deal with the debt, uh, deal with the, um, uh, the uh, adversity of that, but it took a lot out of the company. And we've, we, we, we're, we're not going to let Transmat fall, but mm. it did almost, I did have some rough calls. Mm. Um, it's very much a part of the institution of electronic music, and I will not let it fall because it would be a travesty. And I think for a lot of people that believe in electronic music, to see a label like that just disappear would hurt. Mm. So we're going to be doing more projects again soon. We're always looking for music from people. We listen to every demo. We don't respond if we don't like it, like I said before. If you don't hear anything, then you know we just didn't care for it. Most record companies do it that way anyway. That's pretty standard stuff. You don't hear from a company, you just know they weren't interested. You hear from them, obviously they're interested. They want more. So we're always interested to listen to music. We, we, we listen to all sorts of music, all different types of music. Uh, I had a chance, um, when the label was really doing well, originally to sign um, Portishead, many years ago. Didn't do it. Shoot myself in the foot for that one a thousand times. I haven't done it yet. I will be doing it soon. Um, so, you know, music-wise, we're always looking for all kinds of stuff. Anything and everything. I like to keep people guessing in the music industry. Mm. It's very important. Never, like I said before, Carl Craig, Stacey Pullen, Kenny Larkin, these guys, they got a big net. They jump around and they can do many things. Mm. I, myself, tightrope. You know, I concentrate on my label, on my music that I do, on the way I, on what I play, and that's my thing. 
That's what I chose that path many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. Those guys, they jump around in the net a lot. Transmet Records is, a, is part of that net. Mm -hmm. uh, there's other record companies in Detroit also that are part of that net. We're always looking for music, and we're all there. Any questions? Any questions? Y yes, finally. She needs a microphone. No, we want everybody to hear it. Um, yeah, I sort of want to know more about what you asked, um, what Torsten asked you. Did you ever had like, um, because like you said, you're really focusing on what you do, and I guess it's like really also DJing. So did you ever had like a crisis where you thought, I'm not moving further? Did you, and yeah. if, if yes, what, what like did you do? Did you... Have you been like sick of the music you yes. play the whole time and, and how could you get like more inspiration and do a change there? I've been like that several times. Uh, I'm like that now because uh, I'm fighting for vinyl, which I know is a, is, a, is a fight I won't win. And in the process of the fight, I have to work extra hard to find music. So I still play CDs. But I play very little. I mean, you could, all, you could see what I play as far as CDs are concerned. I'm not against CDs. That's, my, that's the extent of my CD music right here. And it's not even full. Uh, and it's not because I'm anti-vinyl, anti-CD, or anti-download. It's because I really like to play with vinyl. It just, mm, it motivates me. I like to move it. I like to touch it. It's, it's a great feeling. Um, but yeah, I do find myself, you know, in some real sort of moments when I'm lost. Uh, you, just, you have to fight through it. Uh, there is no solution or, or, or recipe to that. You just have to fight through it. You gotta stay strong on that one. Because that's, that's the beginning of falling down, when you give in. But I mean, you were entering a situation which to a, to a certain degree is pretty lucky. It's almost like a Greek tragedy or Shakespearean. You, did, without any doubt, perform a couple of the tracks that build a genre that changed the world to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. Like, how is any human on Earth possibly going to top that? Well, wow, that's a nice thing to say, brother. Thank you. That's some nice shit what he just yeah, said. That's, that's pretty heavy. Thank you. Wake up! <laughs> no, but I mean, that's a heavy burden. I mean, countless shrink builds all of you. will be... An army of shrinks can, you know, solely live on that. Yeah, but you know, I had to, I had to step outside of being an artist, such as to be a DJ. Okay. Oh. There was no way in the world I could be a good DJ, and, and and be an artist at the same time. The reason is because as a DJ and as an artist at the same time, you are too judgmental of others' music. Oh. You can, you you like nothing. Oh. You like absolutely nothing. Everything is shit. Oh, this is shit, that shit. Oh, he did this wrong. Guy's a terrible musician. The mix is crap. This is, you have to step outside of that. Huh. You have to become a DJ. If you're a DJ, you're a DJ. If you're hmm. going to be a musician, you've got to step away from the whole thing hmm. so as to have this not influence what you do. Hmm. And that's the only reason I've survived in it, because I've, I have, I've stepped completely away from it. Hmm. There was somebody with a hand up a minute ago. No, in the back first. The lady back there. <laughs> She's all in. Hello. Then you, of course. Um, I'm interested to know how you find your music. How do you actually go about finding the music that you play? Hmm. Well, I travel quite a lot. And uh, I, I, there are a couple record stores still left in the world that are good ones. Uh, anybody ever get to London? Vinyl Junkies? It's a very good record store owned by this really wacky French dude named JP, Jean-Paul. He's a nut. He's my friend, but he's a complete maniac. Uh, but he has one of the most extensive, extensive record collections in the world. I think you just can find him Vinyl Junkies, like a junkie junkie, vinyljunkie.com. He will ship records to you anywhere in the world. So you use the net as well? Uh, no, because I travel. So I'm able to pretty much go wherever the music is. Japan, Cisco Records. They have seven shops, and they have three of them on the same block. And they're amazing. And within that little radius of, of shops, 
which is no more than a kilometer, they have maybe 17 shops uh, from different shop owners selling everything from vinyl of Usher's new album, which blows my mind that they can they have vinyl of Usher's album, the new one, you know, to Gladys Knight and the Pips, uh, to uh, Kevin Saunderson's new track. You know what I mean? They have it. They have everything. So there, and in Germany, I think in Germany, there's still, there's still. Um, you mean the records you then forget in other people's places? No, yeah. no, no. Don't don't talk about that. I, I mean, uh, there's um, there's Mark still has his shop in uh, Berlin. Yeah, Hardwax. Hardwax is still in Berlin. Uh, I think it'd be Hardwax.com. Uh, Cisco in Japan, I don't think you'll find you'll be able to get anything sent. They won't send anything. The Japanese are the Japanese. They just. Well, I spend, I'm in Japan a lot, maybe, okie dokie, but I'm in Japan a lot, and I tell you now, you will not get the Japanese to send you anything, they just won't do it. They don't, they don't mail out, they just don't. I mean, I wish they did, they just don't do it. Probably, uh, probably they don't deem sing. You get Cisco Records to sing you stuff? Well, if you get them to sing you something, you need to put everybody in here up on it because I, as far as I know, their website is in Japanese and all the information is in Japanese. Yeah, and, and I, I just, I think they would like to do it, but I just don't think they're, they're, they're positioned to do it. There's that, there's hard wax. There's a, so I basically travel and I'm able to come across things. Okay, as an addendum to that, um, you said earlier that you're finding it harder to find good Innovative music? I can't remember the exact quote you used. That's a but, good way of putting it. But innovative music. Mm -hmm. um, but is there some stuff that you could share with us that you are finding innovative and is inspiring you? I have some records here now. I could play a couple for you. Care to mind. share? I'll share it with you, my darling. <laughs> All right. I've got a little indigestion. This mic is right on my throat. It's going to come right through the damn microphone. Oh, we're prepared for that as well. We're prepared for everything. Now what is this? Ter whose turntable is this? I got no idea. This is this part of the company deal or something? What is that? Take one of these. I got it all now. <laughs> what is this? Um, Isla. Yeah, it's some jelly thing Isla. for your throat when you talk a lot. Did you pick it up in there? Islamabad? I'll take one if, if you take one. No, I'm not taking one. <laughs> I'm not in, I don't fall for that. I'll take one <laughs> if you take one. That's, some, see, that's exactly what I don't want to hear. I'll take one if you take one. Right. What the fuck is going on? This is, is this going the right way? What is happening here? <laughs> you know, if you ever set me up with these at a party, I would just kill you. Okay. I think it's going the wrong way. I would never even look at such a Hold thing. Hold on, wait a minute. Reverse. Oh, here we go. There you go. Cool. Yeah. This is... And what is this supposed to be the... This is... What is happening here? This is... This is some bullshit. <laughs> um, after a little message from our sponsors, we come right back. Well, you know, hey, listen. I can tell you some stories about myself in this company, but that's another story. Okay, I has a vat. Oh, that's a volume control. It has a left and right volume control? That's pretty cool. And this is the pitch control, or is this the, this is the curve for the fader? It's got a fader on the turntable? Come on. Now where's the pitch control? That's a good one. Doesn't seem to have one. I find it. I'm a professional, right? I'm supposed to be at least. Too. Wow. Don't tell me, don't show me, let me find it on my own. Don't show me, don't tell me, don't find me, let me look. It must be some stupid button. Or is it? Uh-huh. There's the pitch control. Okay. Well, I guess it's cool if you got like some powered monitors at home. You just want to listen to some tracks. You want to mix like 
Yeah, but who would have such an ugly looking thing in a flat? I think he does. Sounds pretty good, actually. No, this was the back. So. <laughs> Well, it's ugly, but it's not that bad. <laughs> uh, this is a song on Carl Craig's label, Planet E. It just came out. It's called I Can. It's a brand new record. You know what? Okay, cool. Got a couple more things for you, too. I don't just play techno. I play everything. I Can, like I-C-A-N, Can and uh, Planet E Records, planet.com. See, vinyl, you see how you can move with vinyl? Feels good, huh? <laughs> if we had two, we could rock the house a little bit, huh? You could turn this into a party if you want to. Fuck it, turn it into a party. Dim the lights. And... Okay. Put on another one for you, real quick. Just let one play. You know, next record, please get up and dance. Um, probably that? before no, before we turn this into like a jam and let you know it be a little more free. -flow. I smell cigarette smoke. That's not me. I've got a sensitive nose. That's not me either. Um, how has your taste for gear changed over the year? Ah, my taste for gear. Good question. I'm not talking smack. Oh, don't worry. Huh? I understand. My taste for gear has changed immensely, but at the same time it stayed really simplistic. I still love, I worked with Pioneer on the 1000 mixer huh. with Francois Kevorkian, and huh. we worked with him for two years on that mixer. And then mm. they released it, and we thought they were going to make a mixer that was available to everybody. Mm. And the damn thing cost three thousand four hundred dollars. So it was really. It's an very, interesting notion of everybody. That was disappointing. That was mm. very disappointing. So mm. you know, I don't know if you, because Pioneer basically gets no credit for having a quality sound quality mixer. Mm. So they released an eight hundred mixer to kind of compensate the six hundred, mm. and the fact that they made the one thousand too expensive. Mm. And nobody has the one thousand except for myself and Francois and two or three other people in the world. Yes, sir? Uh, we have one in our club. You're a rich guy. <laughs> Where's your club? At Honky Tonks. You played it. Oh, you got one at Honky Tonks? Yeah. On the piano? On the piano. Outstanding. You guys been to Honky Tonks yet? Yeah. Oh, you know about it. Honky Tonks is classic. I love Honky Tonks. Had some great times there, for sure. Definitely some great times. Um, but uh, as far as I uh, still love my turntables, uh, as far as keyboards are concerned, uh, I'm messing around now with, um, uh, as you all know, maybe you don't, Robert Moog, the original designer of the keyboard itself, died. But I really got heavy into that. I've been into to Moog keyboards for, for years, but I really like the, the fatness of the filters. It sounds, they just sound great. Just really good sounding keyboards. It's a hands-on, real keyboard. It's a real nice haptical experience. It's cool, them. man. It's yeah. quite orgasmic, as they say. Yeah. You know, it feels very nice. This lady's smiling. We'll have to give her back in the microphone in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but I know she's thinking something. But anyway, uh, that's, what, that's my thing. I'm actually using my old sequencer, which, do not laugh, is called a Squid SQD1. It's made by Korg. It's a 16-track sequencer. Mm. Uh, you bounce the tracks as you record them, which means that you can't go back and erase the track after you recorded it. So it better be the shit, because it's going to be layered in your, on one of your MIDI channels forever. And the reason I'm using it is because I made uh, so much music with that thing, and it just feels good. You know, I don't have to use a Logic or any particular program just because it's, it's there. Uh, use what you like, go with what you know, don't try to impress friends or family or those so-called colleagues. Do what you do, you know, even if it's old gear. If it works, it works, right? Prince picks up a guitar and what happens? He makes music, he plays. You know, so, I mean, you've got guys who are making major hit records today, recording them on four-track digital little boards. 
So, you know, do, just do what you do. Don't get caught up in this technology. Get caught up in what makes good music. Which is? Which is whatever you like. When you write, when you do your wonderful words, when you're this amazing guy, how do you do them? I'm not going to tell you. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe some hot oil and you know, you get naked and all that kind of stuff? No, I don't want to trigger it off the, your Juan and you and the kind of, you know. Do you feel? I'm going to pass it around. To, I think you want to see, you want to take a look at this because you want to know what's some music, right? Come on up. Come on up here, girl. Do you, do you think there's a certain sense of conservatism in all that kind of music? And just because we like it, we didn't, we're afraid to admit it? Um, in which kind of music it is? This right here? Yeah. No, I think what it is is that don't go too far. <laughs> okay, that's why I only gave her the cover. <laughs> See, I know my stuff, huh? After 20 years, I got something right. Your shoes are untied, by the way. <laughs> uh, I have no idea, I forgot. It would be, just get the 12 inch. Dennis DeSantis. And this one is I Can on Planet E Records. Get everything on Planet E Records. The dude has never made a bad record, period. There is no discussion about that. So you cannot go wrong with Planet E. You cannot go wrong with Dennis DeSantis at the moment. Get your hands on any of that. Get your hands on, on all the transmat stuff you can find. Anyway. You sure uh, that's the right sleeve? No, it's not. But I was in a hurry to get here. Oh, I see. Okay. You didn't, she went to the bathroom. Did she steal my record? No, she didn't. Just kidding. Oh. Um, you were asking about... Mm -hmm. Yeah, just because we really like it, but don't you think there's a certain that the whole post-Detroit kind of sound aesthetic has become some sort of, sort of a cliché in itself. Well, I think dance music has become a cliché, period. I mean, I think that you, I mean, I played a party for the Super Bowl in Detroit, our Super Bowl, our football Super Bowl recently, and um, there was a guy outside, a security guy, a big black dude, local brother from my town. He's doing the door, he's letting people in and out. Outside the door is this amazingly, like, crazy audience that wants to get inside. And there's a couple of his friends that show up. The place is packed, people are having a good time. And the guy says to me, the bouncer who I know, he says, Derek, when are you going on? I said, oh, I don't know, about an hour. He says, well, you need to hurry up because the guy in there playing, everything he plays has the same beat and it's bullshit. The guy playing was Stacy Pullen. The music he was playing was amazing. And this guy was telling me that it all had the same beat and it was bullshit. And that broke my heart a bit because that's exactly what I don't understand about I mean, how is it possible that uh, certain people have become so um, like lost mm. in just listening to anything different. Mm. I mean, I was shocked to hear that, to be honest with you. It was a party, it's a club. It couldn't have been the first time he's heard this kind of music, but mm. I, I, apparently it was. Mm. Because it was so different than what people consider to be dance music. Mm. It wasn't, and it's still very much unique. Mm. It's, not what, it's not what people consider to be typical dance music. Mm. And, and we don't hear that, because we hear this mm. shit all the time. Mm. But we don't realize that. It's still very, very, very particular and unique, mm. the way it sounds. But still, you'd recognize like a car crash tune from like 800 miles away. We would, but the, but the bro working the door doesn't give mm. a goddamn. Mm. But yeah. don't you think that at the same time, it's kind of amazing how much you can get away with in mainstream culture as far as noise and weird structures and stuff are concerned, just because of it being like so household these days? It's got a good start stop to it. I could have been wrong about this turntable. Whose turntable is this? What? It's your turntable? Oh. Um, yeah, I think so. Should we put a question to them? Because they're falling asleep again. I, I think it's probably about time to... Um, call it a day? Call, not call it a day, but to turn it into like a less formal situation. Turn off the mics, say a big, hang, a big, big thank you to you, and then everyone can just come up.